Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for Reverend Jim for his wonderful and generous invitation. What brings us to the path? What is it that makes us ask deep questions? A human being is a very interesting creature. There are so many explanations where we came from, why we are here, and what we are supposed to do with this life. Furthermore, there's even more explanations and teachings what will happen to us after we pass on. If you look at our human situation on this earth, then you see that human beings want something that we cannot get. The first is eternal life. We really want to live a long time in perfect health, with clear senses, in a wonderful environment, and all we get is 70, 80, 90 years, depending on your karma. We want freedom, and what we find is conditioned existence, tied and bound by causes and effects. And we want perfection. And if you lived long enough, then you know that you can try, you can try in earnest, you can try hard, but you cannot be a perfect person in everybody's eyes, including your own. In Zen, we talk about the great question. The great question to which we all can wake up to. What am I, or what is this that I call myself? It seems to be sometimes fruitless to ask such questions. But if you go through your own crises and ask other questions than this, you find out that your sense of identity is really the root of your pleasures and pains. The person you think you are is manifested in the world. And if you clean up that identity, then your presence is clear. Your interaction, your relationship with the world is also clear. And then your function, your action is also clear. But if you are unaware of who you are, you carry in your soul's backpack all your delusions, misconceptions, and then that's what radiates to the world. So Zen goes to the very bottom of our existence, and the great question goes like this. When you do not think of good and bad, what is your original face? In short, what are you? Before the who appears, before the person appears, what are you? What is it that sees with your eyes, hears with your ears, feels with your heart, thinks with your mind? What is that? In my tradition, monks, nuns, and lay people spend years with this question. Every single day in meditation we ask, what is this? And we let the answers appear and disappear. Because what appears and disappears is not what we are looking for. They are partial truths. But the experience of the source of the question brings us closer to our true nature. And that truly is a blessing. Out of the experience of the great question comes great faith. If you do not experience the source of your faith, you cannot believe anything. We talk about divinity, spirit, God, energy. Where do all these words come from? What is the mind that thinks that? What is the heart where they all come from? Meditation means you go back to that source which originally has no words, no speech, no name, no form. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. What is this I? If you understand this I, you understand God. And you need the third important element, which is great courage. 
If you have the courage to follow through with your spiritual endeavors, you will certainly attain something. It will bring your human qualities to a higher level. But if you do not clean your mind, if you do not dispel your illusions, you remain as you are. And as you get older, these routines, habits, or karmas take hold of you. Change them while you can. Awakening means that we reduce all beings' suffering. We bring the ultimate medicine to heal the world from the wounds that we inflict upon each other. This kind of clarity brings you to the experience of oneness, where you and God, the other persons, all people, all sentient beings, do not appear as separate entities. The experience of oneness goes without thinking, without words, without speech, as you return to this moment only. When you hear this sound, there is no thinking. For a moment, your mind is still. For a moment, there is no purity or impurity. Good or bad, high or low, heaven and hell. This is the moment we are striving for, and not just to attain it, but to keep it. Later on, offer it to all beings. When we are sick, where does our sickness come from? Buddha Shakyamuni himself was called the great physician or the great healer because he pointed out the Four Noble Truths, the fact of suffering, the illness, the cause of suffering, why you have that. The end of suffering, health. And the way to end suffering, the cure. If you're sick, where does that come from? What kind of karma is it? What did you have to think and feel and speak and do to make yourself sick? If you embark on this journey, you will perceive cause and effect very clearly with your own mind's eyes. We call that using your own true nature, thus becoming spiritually autonomous. Autonomous does not mean that you are isolated. Autonomous does not mean that you're practicing alone. We put our efforts together in a congregation, in a sangha, so that we could help each other by making our own effort at the same place and same time. When we are sick, we need help. What kind of help is it? If somebody gives you good energy and healing energy, you may feel relieved. How long? If you are attached to your karma, that brought about the illness, the healing energy will have very limited effect because you still identify with that kind of thoughts, words, speech, and feelings that made you sick. If you let go of that, you become clear and the energy will have lasting effect. And doctors and healers can really help you. But they cannot go beyond your own attachments your own prefixed ideas, your own sense of self. So you take away the illusion of your ego and you take away the roots of all your suffering. See the connection between emotions and your state of health. What kind of emotions you harbor and what kind of state your body and mind are in. My teacher, Zen Master Sung San, had a heart condition in the 80s and he resided in the United States of America at that time, and he had to go to the hospital. And the doctors asked him, 
Sir, we know you are a Zen master. Couldn't you fix your own heart? And he said, if I went up to the mountains for 100 days and did a solo retreat, yes, I could fix my heart. So then the doctors who were really interested in meditation, they asked him then, Sonsanim, why don't you do that? It would be so wonderful. And then Zen Master Sung San said with his distinct smile, I don't do this because it wouldn't be correct teaching. This is something you can take home and digest. Why would it not be correct teaching for the Zen Master to heal himself, to fix his own heart? It would direct us to a direction which we could not follow beyond death. Because when you lose your body, you don't lose your karma and you don't lose your mind. If you do not have the direction to clean up your mind, harmonize your karma with the world, and be a selfless person on the path, then no matter how much you deal with the body, you will get disappointed, disillusioned, and ultimately you will have a sense of failure. No matter how good food you eat, no matter how good treatment you get, eventually the body will leave you. Having said that, it's important to keep it in good condition, but not for yourself. Not just for your own well-being. For your family, for your friends, even for your adversaries. You should be a good adversary, okay? And all beings, that you would be the solution rather than the problem. Oftentimes we talk about body and soul. In our view, the body is the hardware. It has eyes, ears, nose, tongue, its brain to think with. Thus we produce concepts, distinctions, and memories. All together, our memories, our distinctions, and our thought processes is the soul. The soul is the software. In Zen, we are looking for the operator. That's why you are asking the great question, what is this? What am I? Furthermore, what is my direction? Where am I really going? What is the effect of my life and death on this planet? These are questions of no small importance. If you answer these for yourselves, you can be a content and maybe even happy person, independent of your surroundings. If not, then your good condition changes and your mind also changes. And all these wonderful purposes that you set out for yourself may just vanish. I suggest you look into that very deeply. I suggest you ask the question you believe in. And that question opens up your mind. Definitions keep the mind between approved limits. Dogmas put the mind into chains and the prison of ignorance. And ignorance is not just feeling like a prison. Ignorance produces adverse reactions like greed and anger. And if you look at your own bad moments when you really do not want to face yourself due to the thoughts and feelings you're entertaining, where do these come from? What kind of views? What kind of self-image? What kind of judgment? And if that moment becomes clear, you go further up on the path of awakening. If you miss these moments, then the problems repeat themselves. Prayer is important. But meditation really brings you to the root of all phenomena. And as the closing statement of my introductory, I would like to quote one of the most important sutras that Buddha Shakyamuni taught. It's called the Avatamsaka Sutra, or the Flower Garland Sutra, which says, 
if you want to understand the nature of this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. What is this mind? Is it God's mind? Does he have one? Is it your mind alone? Is it a group's mind? All human beings maybe on this planet, 7.3 billion people and counting? Or some others? What is this mind? And then we are back to the question that I encourage you to deal with. That makes you a better person. That makes you a clearer person. And then you can use your karma to help other beings instead of your karma using you and making you a selfish, problem-ridden individual. So this is a time when I'm asking for any kind of question from the audience. Would you be able to clarify the difference, if any, between karma and dharma? Thank you for your question. Uh, karma is cause and effect, the repetition of cause and effect, the accumulation of these repetitions into habits or tendencies, the identification with these habits as personality traits, then these characteristics become your person. A person associates with another, it becomes a group karma, family or larger. That's what we observe. And the observation gives us insight how this karma operates, what kind of cause brings what kind of result. And that insight gives us the experience of the law, the law of the universe, how we operate, how we function as human beings, whether individual, couple, family, society, civilization, you name it. This law is the Dharma. Strange? Look into that. So the Dharma is the teaching, but it's not just what you find in books. In fact, it's a very small part of all the books that was ever written about our function or the universe's function, okay? Written teaching is like a fisher's net. It catches log logical conclusions and gives you insights. And verbal teaching is pretty important at the very beginning. But the fisherman's net can only catch fish and by catch. It cannot catch the sea. So if the fisherman is interested in the sea itself and not just the fish, he would have to put down the net of conceptual thinking and jump and take a swim in the sea. This is not what fishermen do. Thinkers want to use their own cognitive tools. That's why we are stuck with verbal teaching most of our lifetimes. And we are trying to believe them, repeat them, sort them, make difference between one another. We are preoccupied with that for decades. And we do not get to the nonverbal part. I give you a little hint how to start. We say the sky is blue. But the sky doesn't say I am blue. So I'm asking you, why is the sky blue? That's where the unwritten part begins. So see how the sky becomes blue in your mind, how you interpret that, how you label that, how you create that. And then you have a little spark, a little insight how our mind operates. It's so fast that you really have to keep your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's why we meditate. That's why we observe. That's why we turn our energy inwards and try to find the unwritten law that is constantly in operation and it does not depend on anything. So that's the Dharma, the unbound, the unwritten, which can have written versions, but they're just as imperfect and insufficient as a fisherman's net versus the sea. So nice to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My question is, in your belief system, in order to learn about karma, your own karma, and then release from that karma, the first part of the question is, is meditation the primary practice? 
And the other part of the question is, what other practices do you do to release from your karma? I sense that you use the word karma in the sense of destiny. And it might be true if we do not see that karma. If you keep your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror, you can perceive your karma before you say something or do something or even think or feel something. That mind space gives you a choice. We always say your mind mirror should always be greater and stronger than the karma right in front of it. Karma is not special. It's all our sensory perceptions, what we see, hear, taste, smell, touch, and then what we think as a concept, the distinctions we make as good and bad, and all our memories, subconscious or conscious. Now the interesting part, and you asked about release, you can do it in two ways, depending on the kind of karma that you carry. Is it just your own individual problem, or did you already hurt someone? Sometimes you have to apologize and you have to make amends to fix that karma on the outside. But first you have to see it inside so that your apology would be sincere and not just a form, something superficial or even hypocritical. In that part of our consciousness where we make good and bad, right or wrong, we also decide on identification. It's very quick. Usually it's not conscious. Whatever supports my existence, my creation, my possessive instincts, and prevents me from impermanence or death, that's good for me. We label that as good. And we want to identify with all the good experiences to preserve ourselves as long as possible. It's a spontaneous identification. That's how you bind karma to yourself. And this is still the better part. Because when you label something as bad, because it threatens you, it robs you, it deforms you, it hurts these three instinct groups of creation, possession, and self-preservation, then it becomes a negative identification. And you're constantly afraid of that. And you still attract that as a negative attraction. And that's how we create good and bad karma for ourselves and others. So if you want to release that, then remove the label of good and bad. Remove yourself from the center. Just perceive cause and effect as they are in relation to the karma that you are talking about, whether it's thoughts, feelings, words, or action, or any kind of sensory perception. We call that just doing it. Just see, just hear, just feel, just talk, but don't make eye on top of it. The precondition for that is do not make good or bad label on top of it. See the direction. See what it does. Does it cause suffering? Does it cause happiness? And decide which one you want. Sometimes one moment of bitter teaching is better than 10 hours of empty talk. So then you can release the karma, but of course it's not over. It's still in your backpack, but it's not controlling you from behind anymore then you can use that karma later to help other people. Okay? Yes. Is Buddhism a religion or a teaching? Which one do you want? Ah. Do you want the teaching aspect? I give you teaching forever. You want the worship part? I put you before a Buddha statue or a Bodhisattva and you can bow forever and chant. So Buddhism is very skillful. For over centuries it has taught hundreds of millions of people. Some people had to be taught at the religious level where the Buddha or its aspects were externalized necessarily. And that practice was enough for that person in that situation. 
But if you really focused on it like you became monk or a nun, you got the teaching that was necessary to really bring you into, I should say, an autonomous position. That's where the teaching on Buddha nature, enlightenment, helping all beings, the Bodhisattva path, it became real. Okay? Which one do you want? The teaching? So come and meditate. If you meditate, you really come into your own as a practitioner. And then we test your clarity with beautiful Zen Kongan interviews. That's where the fun begins. Okay? Because we do not just talk about clarity. We also train and test that. And you may have heard about Zen Kongans. They are very paradoxical stories where your conceptual thinking and your emotional patterns do not bring you good solutions. The solutions at best will be partial. But many times they are totally misdirected. So the Zen answers are not something esoteric, least of all something dysfunctional. In fact, they bring you back to a much better function through the use of your own intuition. So when your true nature begins to work spontaneously, that's when your intuition kicks in. And that's when the teaching becomes really operational. Not something just as an intellectual study. You have a wonderful train of thought and you feel much better after that. Yeah, but you still have to do your homework. You still have to ride your car, earn your money, be with your family. So how does that work, really? Meditation in our style is not confined to the Dharma room or the shrine. The original teaching says, whether you are sitting, standing, lying down or walking, silent, talking, in a dream or in a wakeful state, constantly without interruption, what is this? That's when the teaching really becomes yours. The Dharma room is really like a service station where your car is tuned up, fluid levels checked, gearbox, alignment, wipers, everything in place. And then you go on the highway. Okay? You live your life. Studies are important. Respect is important. Worship in the sense of externalizing the Buddha and making it separate from yourself, different from you entirely, that would be a mistake. I ask you, you and your Buddha nature, are they the same or different? You say same, mistake. Different, also mistake. More questions? Back there. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm learning so far that there is a difference between uh, prayer and meditation. I was hoping you can explain the difference. Um, and also, why, w why is it, what is the benefit in meditation? Why should one do it? And what is the best way or what are the best steps to take to meditate uh, and silence the mind when there is so much chatter? Where do all your questions come from? They come from not knowing. This don't know is our meditation. That's why we meditate to attain this don't know 100%. Now, prayer is towards a purpose. You pray for somebody's recovery. You pray for all beings being happy. So it's energy going outside and doing something. Meditation means energy goes inside and you clean everything up. Okay? If you like, you can do both, but don't mix. You should know what you're doing moment to moment. Then you can be very efficient and very correct. I was wondering if you could talk about maybe a few things that I've been experiencing. One is the emptiness of being and um, in which all is present. The other thing I was interested in you talking Hold about. It. Emptiness of being and what was next? Um, 
In the emptiness, it's all always there. So the emptiness is always there. There's always something present there. There, it's empty, but it is a paradox of everything is present in the emptiness. Uh huh. And it's a choice at any moment. It seems to me. All right. So, so I have I have a very important book that I would like you to read on emptiness mm -hmm. and nothingness. It's called Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Okay. I'm pointing at the particular section when Winnie the Pooh visits Rabbit. And we all know that where Winnie the Pooh appears, then milk and honey just flies out of the window. Everything in the storage goes to Pooh's stomach, his wonderful, cute little belly. So Rabbit knows this. And then Pooh says, is there anybody home? Knock, knock. Rabbit says, no, nobody. <coughs> Pooh, you know, he doesn't have a Pentium 5 up here. Kind of slow. But he comes to a very logical conclusion. Nobody cannot say nobody. In order to have this word nobody, there has to be somebody. So who is that? It's Rabbit. Open up, open up. Then, of course, Sunday morning begins with a wonderful feast. So if you think that life is empty, and that's what your mind does, don't let that happen. It's an illusion. When you say, life is full of wonders, that's also illusion. In Zen we have a term called suchness, that things are just as they are, or the world is just like this, neither good nor bad, neither empty nor full. So you can come to a state of mind which in Zen speak, we term as neither form nor emptiness. Neither a bunch of positive statements or just one negative that's doing away with all. So see things as they are. See the processes around you as they happen. Look inside and see how your thoughts and feelings stream. They flow. In Theravada, they call it stream enterer. If you perceive this mind stream, you are a stream enterer. And that is like having a drone over a very large swath of sea or lake. You see the surface from an unprecedented angle. And that's why we turn our energy inwards and use the correct meditation technique. We can use a mantra, we can use the question I've said, you can also perceive directly sound and space, and that's what opens up your internal space. That's how you can perceive your own internal vibrations, your feelings, your thoughts, your sensation of past, present, future, your subtle distinctions of good and bad. Our mind is a supremely complex and very capable entity. Understand it, attain it, clear it, use it. It's plenty of jobs. You say empty, mistake. It's an idea, and it's a false idea. You say it's a fixed form, absolute, immutable, independent of you, also a mistake. Okay? Remember this, neither form nor emptiness. This will help you. Okay. Thank you. That keeps your eyes and ears and all senses very clear. You're welcome. I have a 10-year-old son and I was wondering, for children, what's the best um, method, I guess, maybe, to get them used to, like, regular meditation and maybe, like, how long or how many times a day? I wouldn't have them sit down. They wouldn't do it anyway. You know, they yeah. would feel constrained. They would feel that meditation is a posture where I don't want to be. Instead, play with the 10-year-old and make the 10-year-old son conscious of cause and effect. Sometimes you just have to ask, what's his name? Kenley. Kenley, wonderful name. Kenley, do you hear what you're saying? I don't want you to hear. I don't want you to say this. Do you want yourself to say this? So make Kenley conscious of his own speech, his own words, his own thoughts and his own emotions, and of course the actions. Just point out cause and effect. Not always 
in real life situations because their minds are not so strong. Their willpower is, sometimes their anger and desire already is, but their human mind, not so strong yet. They react very quickly. I and mean, we are seriously talking about entering adolescence. And that's, where, that's when they really go nuclear. So, <laughs> so play with Kenley, make Kenley conscious. And the third leg of the tripod here is answer his questions. That's all. That's Zen. Answer the questions, share the game, point out cause and effect. Thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, much for listening. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, knowing that everything is energy and that there is a respect for all of life, including plants and ants and everything, where does one come to a point where there isn't a feeling of sadness of having to cut a plant or trim the bushes, I find myself in this place. I talk to it first and apologize, but I still have not been able to come to some understanding where I am comfortable with even trimming the bushes or anything like that, or even killing a bug. Um, I'm a vegetarian and I'm inching towards being a vegan because I know that these animals suffer. And so I have that too. So <laughs> I guess I'm just asking for some wisdom um, as far as how far does one, per how far does a human, because I'm actually, we're humans having a spiritual experience um, or spiritual be beings having a human experience. So. All right. We are sharing the same situation with our diet. In fact, I've been a vegetarian for a very, very long time. Let me ask you a question. Yes. When did you last have a haircut? About three weeks ago. Did you apologize to your hair? No, I didn't. OK, because you know it's not going to hurt. Your hair is not going to fall out. So it's, it's going to grow. So why apologize to the bushes or the trimmed grass or all the plants that you do not kill but you trim, they don't suffer. They don't feel any pain. It's like you trimming your hair. But when it comes to animals, it's a totally different ball game. They have a soul. The higher the consciousness level is, the bigger the suffering is. So if you have to eat meat for some reason, please, Take it at the lowest possible consciousness level. But as you go towards you know, birds and mammals, etc., the suffering is greater and greater. The closest it is biologically to human being, and that is pig slash pork, then you are doing very, very big harm. Beef too. So be very careful. The environmental damage and the human damage by consuming red meat is terrible. If we just could leave that behind and consume something else, we would save quite a bit of this planet. Very, very large territories could be redeemed. So please deal with the important problems. First things first. Don't worry about plants, because unless you totally exterminate them, they reproduce. And they do not have that kind of soul or energy body that animals have or humans have. Okay? Uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, and like everyone has said. I'm just going to ask it. I'm sure you've meditated on this for years and years. What happens when we die? <laughs> I'd like to know your meditation and your viewpoints. I know we all have probably, we all think about it. It's the big question in the house. When you wake up in the morning, what determines the quality of your awakening? I, I think what you're asking me is like, what's the difference between when I go to sleep and no. awake? What do you mean? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Everybody wakes up with a certain mindset and physical feeling 
whether it's tired or energetic, or a clear mind, or one that is just all over the place. Sometimes you become conscious in a nanosecond and you're awake, and sometimes it takes 10, 15 minutes just to find the doorknob to your bathroom. This is the quality difference I'm talking about. What determines this? Please, tell me. It's so multifactorial and complex. Exactly. But Nobody can answer it. The greatest minds have meditated and never can answer it until you die. I guess that's the only way you'll know. Actually, that's where you have a chance. <laughs> yeah, but I was hoping you'd like tell me the answer hoping, so I wouldn't have to die and know it. <laughs> hoping? What? <laughs> I was, I don't know, I was just hoping you'd say some magical thing to make me feel exactly. better. Exactly. So I would be comforted to know there's something and I could just sleep it's better. It's so good you spell this out. And I I'm know, because everybody probably is wondering about this. <laughs> and I'm here to disappoint. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> because, because you don't know the answer. <laughs> that's your idea. I don't know. However, if you look at the previous day, the previous two days, the previous week, the previous month, that determines that particular moment when you wake up in the morning and then you will have some experience of your own body and mind. What you dreamt, what you ate, what you did, you know, previously, it's all causes and conditions that determine the quality of your wake up experience. So you're asking me what happens when you wake up after this life, when you can no longer return to the body, it depends on everything you have done in this life. What you thought, felt, spoke, did, what you identify with. Remember the hardware and the software metaphor? When the hardware is broken, the software goes up to the cloud. And then from the cloud, it finds the new hardware to continue the routines that you built in. So watch out for this moment because this is the only thing we have. The only place and time of awareness is right here and right now. Depending on the quality of the mind that you have, you will have a death experience. You will have a next lifetime experience. So the way you keep your mind right now determines that. Nothing else. Is this hopeful enough? Yes, actually, yes. Thank you, because like... Good. I'm here to encourage. Yes. Do you see that? I do. Wonderful. Be <laughs> yes, but you know what? It, it, answers a, it answers something. I've been searching and searching and wondering, am I wasting my time by like... I, I, you know, I'm obsessed with, you know, trying to meditate nature and like trying to like go up a few notches so that if there is something to look forward to, that I've prepared myself for the journey by questioning. Go Do down a few notches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good to point. Your, to your tantien. Because ah. when you're desperate up in your heart and your mind, you really go hyper. Everyone does. Because you always believe you have to ratchet up a few more notches. Rev up the engine. Let's go to heaven now. You know, it's, it's not going to work. I mean, hello. It's just keep it simple. Keep it clear. Keep it at the energy point where your mind and energy do not differ. The point of one mind, one energy. That's two inches below your navel. That's why we call it the energy garden, the Tantian, okay? When we are born, we are born with what we call original energy. That's what your soul contains, in Korean, Wongi. This universe, compared to us, is much greater. So Koreans called it Daegi, great energy. And the relationship between that is Kongi, or empty energy, which is our breath. So when we start breathing, you know, after the cord is cut, we begin to live. When we breathe our last, that's it. We're done. So as long as we are alive, Wongi, Kongi, and Daegi are connected. But if we are attached to our thoughts, our speech, our actions, our feelings, we make a wall between ourselves and the world. Then we lose our breath, we lose the connection, we are locked up in ourselves. So when you meditate, 
you bring all this energy down and you do not entertain conscious thoughts. Your thoughts are there anyway, but they're kind of free roll. They're just running, like the mind stream that I mentioned before. And when you watch your breath, Kongi, then Wongi and Degi can combine and unite. And when these three energies combine and unite, we call that Hapki or unified energy. And this unification activates the self-cleansing property of the mind. It's like heating up something, like a metal surface which had ice on it. It's frozen, so the ice stays. But if you heat it up, the ice melts. The same thing is true with the mind and karma. You heat up the mind, your karma melts, you and this universe become one. And it activates not only the self-cleansing property of the mind, we call that Buddha nature, but within limits, and I emphasize within limits, it activates the self-healing capability of the body too. Remember the autoimmune illnesses. What do they depend on? Your own mind quality. Remember the psychosomatic illnesses. What do they depend on? To your attachment of your own karma. You can change all that. But it doesn't give you perfection, doesn't give you eternal life, doesn't give you unbound freedom. These are the ideas we have to let go of. And once you do that, you are real. You are one with the universe. You perceive true Dharma and you can use it for yourself and all beings. That's our job. And then we are true humans, walking on the path of enlightenment and helping others wake up too, because we do not entertain false views. Therefore, we can help others gently to get rid of it. I'm wondering if you could speak to the use of music in your daily practice and its use in general. Music and chanting are, I think, the most universal assets in any religion, any worship, any meditation. What's interesting for me about music is that it really takes your thinking away and puts you into a flow, whatever music that is. But depending on the kind of music that you're listening to, your mind is taken to different places. So be careful what kind of music you're listening to because it's deeply conditioning your consciousness. When you chant, there's melody and some speech together. That's when the meaning and the sensation are inextricably together. You look at light and you can perceive it as a wave or as a bunch of particles called photons. So when you look at the message, you can listen to its melody or you can listen to its meaning. And in music and chanting, these two are combined and they go in much deeper. They do a much better job because you forgot your own noise and you could absorb both the melody, the energy, the vibration, and the meaning, the message, the cognitive part. So whether it's instrumental music or vocal music, it has pretty much the same effect, but one has a cognitive aspect, the vocal, and the other just has the impression, the energy aspect, that's just instrumental. And I believe that, and it's on a personal note, for our own good health, listen to music at least once a day. Or chant some mantra at least once a day. Wipe out the unnecessary garbage and terminate the noise inside with something gentle and beautiful and progressive. You choose what that is for you. But remember, whatever vibration you put inside your mind, that's what you will project to the outside, and that's what generates the events in your life, the relationships, everything. Okay? You have the same vibes, you get the same guys. Remember. <laughs> Next question. I guess this isn't really a question as much as I just wonder what you might have to say about this. I once heard a saying, um, and it, I think of it every day. The saying, and I can't tell you who said it, but the saying is, either nothing in this world is a miracle, or else everything is. 
What do you think of that? Let's go drink some tea. More questions? <laughs> Thank you. I want to share something and, and get your view of it. I want to share a bit of my own discipline and how listening to you, it might relate and something you might be able to remark on. So part of my journey and path has been to meditate. And in my meditation practice, it was creating space, similar to the question that was asked earlier. And in that space, becoming an observer. And yet, simultaneously, being aware of the participant. So that in my consciousness, I was noticing that I was thinking. I was noticing that I was feeling. I was noticing the actions that this physicality of my being was taking. And yet it was a simultaneous experience more and more in my daily living. I was able to be aware both of my participation in conditional reality and my observance of that. And over time, it appears that a third component, so to speak, in that awareness became the observer of the observer rather than just one who was watching what I was being or doing within the world or in my day or in my activities of this illusion, so to speak, that we live within. And a big portion of the beginning part of my discipline or pathway had to do with this creating space and opening and releasing and letting go and feeling as if the further I could open up or expand or step away from the I am that I am in this world that I'm expressing myself was the goal, so to speak. And in the last decade or so, there's been a guidance to actually both look upon from this place of observer and embrace the I am in this world rather than becoming aware of and understanding, and I don't mean with mind, but the knowing of my being in this world, it's a union of both as one as I attempt to practice in the moment from place to place and time to time. And so I, I feel like the question that was being asked earlier about the emptiness and the fullness at the same time relates somewhat to what I'm talking about. And if I hear you, then Zen is the practice of, on some level, becoming the observer unattached to the participant, and yet one with it at the same time. Observer and the observed. If in your mind they are neither the same nor different, then you're on the right track. But do not make the observer multi-layer. One observer is enough, that's it. Too many, you have a joint chiefs of staff. Too much, okay? Thank you. <laughs> keep it simple, keep it clear. Everything's okay, okay? I have a request. Please. In this particular philosophy of metaphysical spirituality, there are two topics that are primary in our teachings and our philosophy. One of them is healing, and one of them is mediumship. I was wondering if there's time and a place that you might comment on healing and mediumship from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, healing, I think we have covered uh, to a very large extent, but let me just sum it up a little bit. Uh, you have to decide whether you heal the body or the mind. These are two different directions. And uh, it is necessary to reduce the physical symptoms in order to give back somebody's mental autonomy. And I think if we talk about transcendence or spiritual values, then we cannot stop at just physical healing. We have to take one more step, and ultimately bring the mind to its own clarity, and give a practice to 
everybody where you can keep your mind clear and you do not get sick mentally and you don't make others sick with your karma. So meditation and prayer can really point to that. Mediumship is something that needs a lot of clarity and preparation. If you wish to open yourself up to other beings, you are inviting guests into your mind. In Korean, they are called mind guests. Keep them as long as you wish, but then get them out of the house when they are of no use anymore. You keep the mind guests, they will want to become hosts. And this is something you cannot allow. You are the owner of your mind and body, no one else. Going back to the past can help to a limited extent, but do not stay in the past. Inviting beings from the non-sensual realm, from the transcendental realm, may help somewhat, but ultimately it is you who has to clean up your own karma and take care of your own body and soul. Use any method you believe is non-harmful and leads you to your purpose. But remember, what you took, you also have to let go. If you're attached to any being, any thought, any form, any appearance, whether it's inside your mind or outside, you are putting yourself into bondage. A bondage that you will later want to release but if you are used to this too much, you cannot, because you began to be identified with that state of mind, including your mind guests. The other is do not attach to emptiness. Do not attach to your own freedom only, or the empty mirror which refuses to show reality because you love emptiness. That's possible too. So do not fall in love with any kind of form and want to keep it permanently, including those beings that you let yourself channel through you, okay? Be very clear with time, place, conditioned existence and direction, why you do this, how you do this, when it starts, when it ends, and do the cleanup afterwards. Otherwise, your consciousness remains wide open and you cannot cash your checks. Because you're, you are not there at your ATM. You cannot do your shopping because your hand cannot grab the bag. And you want to talk to your family, but half of them is not there. You just imagine that they are. These are the problems of mind guests and weak consciousness. So stay clear, stay solid, stay unmoving, and never let go of your one mind. This one mind has no object or the lack of object. But that's the host. That's what you truly are. If you're careful, you can stay simple and clear and you can help yourself and others manage your problems. If not, the medium becomes the victim of his or her own karma. Do not let that happen because no one can really get you out of it. Only yourself. But if you break, if you go into a shock, if you go crazy, then it's very difficult to help you. Do not let that happen. As I sit and think about some of what I've continually read about Buddhism, more as a reference to sharing what I do, and I've listened to you this evening, I've heard you use two different terms that I would ask you to distinguish. One spoken of quite a bit is mind and the other is consciousness. And I've heard you refer to mind in ways that I might define consciousness, and then heard you use consciousness, and I'm curious if you could bring a distinction between those. You are sharp. <laughs> so, to add some spice to today's Dharma cocktail, uh, there's mind with a small m, the lowercase m. That's your sixth consciousness, the concept maker. That's when the sky becomes blue because your mind made that and attached that to the form. 
So that's where you make names, attach them to the forms. That's where you analyze your math. That's where you solve your equations. It's a conceptual mind, all with a lower case. And I mentioned the hardware and the software and the eight levels of consciousness of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind with a lowercase m, concept maker. Another function of this mind, the personal, is the distinctions, the seventh. And the eighth is the memory. It's all with this personal mind. And then comes mind with the capital M. It's not part of the eight levels of consciousness, but perceives all this. That's the great observer. Okay? And consciousness can be distinguished pretty much in the same way, but the way I use it is actually uh, the sixth, the conceptual mind. That's your individual intellectual consciousness. And when I refer to the great mind, that's awareness or Buddha nature or the great round mirror that has no likes or dislikes. There are many epithet on ornance for that. All right? Thank you. Okay, my question to you is, um, I have felt for a long time that um, I was born with the purpose of carrying on the gifts that were given to me uh, from a very young age. And so in meditation, um, how do I, what, what would be, be the best way to approach that in being able to present those? Repeat the purpose, please. The spiritual gifts that I was given at, at a young age. What are they? They're uh, metaphysical medium gifts. And I know that... Um, I see the label. I don't see the article. So what are those metaphysical gifts? Um, being able to talk to people that have passed. Okay. Um, seeing them, hearing them. Okay. Um, Spirit has spoken to me and told me, giving me ideals as far as direction, as far as what I could be doing with that. But I want to know how to kind of go into meditation and kind of um, figure out where I'm, where I'm led to go with that. All right. So we have a very important practice we call internal question. I've mentioned that briefly. But for you, the specific tailor-made question for this kind of mind is, how can I help? I will not give you a ready-made answer like a package you pick up in a store. But I point your mind to a direction where you go, you actually find your own answer. And that's where this question leads you. How can I help? And in order to practice that, you should really sit in meditation. And with every in-breath for like 30 minutes every day, you ask this question, how may I help? And do not believe any of the answers that would appear. Just keep the question and all your karma will follow that moment to moment. Why? Because that's what you condition yourself to be. The how may I help you person. And all your karma that you mentioned, the spiritual gifts, the metaphysical inclination, everything will follow that. If you'd like to externalize it, then the great helper is the bodhisattva of compassion. There are many appearances for her. In Korean, she is Kwan Sen Bosal. In Sanskrit, it's Avalokiteshvara. In Japanese, Kanze on Bosatsu. Many names. In the West, it's Virgin Mary. And we do bowing practice sometimes and mantra practice to become one with this compassion. Because sometimes, no matter how much you ask in your intellect, in your mind, how can I help? It just the cart doesn't move. And finally, you realize that you just cannot hit, hit the cart anymore. You have to find a horse and put the horse before the cart and motivate the horse to pull and then the cart moves. Compassion is a great motivator. So if you do compassion practice besides the gifts that you have got, it keeps your mind very steady, very clear, pointing to the right direction, and then you can use your karma very, very well. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm pretty fairly new to meditation, but um, during my meditations, especially recently, I've um, had feelings of overwhelming love 
I guess is how I would describe it. Um, sometimes it's so joyful and makes me cry. <laughs> um, so I just am kind of trying to figure out how, what to do with that energy when I feel it. All right, what happens when you prepare Christmas presents quite a few weeks or days before Christmas? What happens? Um, you're very happy and you're okay. just Practically what happens, you feel all this love towards yes. your family members and friends, etc. Mm -hmm. And you gift wrap all your boxes and you label them and you wait, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Great, do the same thing with your loving feelings inside. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, thank you for being here this evening. Hi, thank you for listening. Could you please elaborate on the power of intention and how it relates to your personal karma? The power of attention is infinite. If you have this moment because you are aware and you're paying attention, you have everything. You lose attention, you lose the moment, you lose everything. And with attention, you can move mountains. Attention is the foundation of mindfulness. Mindfulness is the foundation of awareness. Awareness leads you to enlightenment. If your mind space is clear, you can really experience infinity because your attention can pay attention to anything, everything, anyone, and everyone. Sung San Sim used to say, clear like space and sharp like a needle. So you have to be able to pay attention to one point and to the surroundings at the same time. Multiple points and the surroundings at the same time. It's like a muscle in your body. You can exercise that. You can develop that. Also, you can let it go rusty or be filled with, the, with just very limited sensory perceptions like television. Exercise your attention, close and far. Human, not human. Dark or light, like nighttime. Pay attention with the unmoving mind, without hopes or fears, nighttime. So there are special meditation exercises for that, but you choose what you believe in. Okay? Right, Attention you. is our great asset. Okay? Thank Sharpen you. it. Use it. Train it. As you're speaking and you began to speak of compassion, one of the things I read and experience frequently is, are the words kindness, compassion. And then my purpose of being of service. I was in a conversation even today where we were sharing about having been burdened by a difficult situation. And there was a suggestion made that to pray for others. And in that praying for others, the shift occurred for this individual to experience a healing, not because they prayed for themselves, but they were praying for others. Could yeah. you speak on compassion, kindness, service? Service is a huge part of our philosophy, also being of service and how that f works with our pathway and our, our evolution of our awakening. I give you a metaphor because it's really profound and striking. Imagine a very large room in a medieval castle, a huge table, and everybody sitting around that table, which is laden with food and drinks and desserts and everything that you might desire. But all human beings have these very long spoons and forks tied to their lower arm. So no matter what they do, they cannot feed themselves. And there's a total pandemonium, total chaos. They, they fight, they try to put it near their mouth, or they just crouch to the table, and it's a terrible sight, it's a terrible vista. And then someone has this really amazing thought to use the same situation to feed each other. And immediately everything's fine. Immediately there is interaction and harmony and the good use of all this wonderful food on the table. With healing is the same. Actually, walking on the path is the same. If I do this for myself only, then it's like being in this very awkward situation where I want to feed myself, but I cannot. Something's missing. Something got short-circuited. When you release that, then you actually see the other person, the other human being, as someone more important than yourself. 
then you are really on the path. Then you can really help them heal and they will help you back. And you have a loving relationship. This love is recycled between at least two people. And this recycling is so strong that it becomes much more than the sum of its parts. And this is the kind of loving energy that we all want and we can recycle that in various ways, with various frequencies, between all of us. And I wish that all of our minds would be unhindered to do this, that we would all attain this moment, oneness, clarity, wisdom and compassion to do this. Because today's good news is that we are all capable of that. Originally, no hindrance. We can all go on the path of awakening and helping all beings. And this is what I sincerely wish for all of us tonight and for many, many years to come. Thank you for your attention.